So when, when I, started I started my astronomy journey a couple years ago, right as COVID was touching off, uh, we didn't have this club, or at least we didn't have the gatherings. And so one of the things I did is I turned to this online web forum called cloudynights.com. If you haven't seen it, it's just an incredible treasure trove spanning every corner of, of astronomy. Um, quickly, I got really into the gear stuff. I'm kind of a gadget guy, a little bit like Dan, I think. Um, and I was learning the specifications of the optical tubes and the eyepieces and trying to get it all specced out. And some people were saying, ah, oh, you got to have a super wide angle eyepiece. You really want that. And I was like, what does it do? Tell me what it does. Does it make me feel like I'm spacewalking? I was asking these astronomers to get in touch with their feelings. And they were having, they were just describing to me the technical details of, you know, angular field of view and how that would impact what I saw in the eyepiece. But I really want to know how I would feel. Is it really worth splurging for this? Or is it just seeing more at higher magnification? So, but eventually I found one astronomer who also must have taken a poetry class or something because he was able to sort of help me think through how telescopes that really zoom in can create emotional experiences at the eyepiece for smaller objects or objects with a lot of detail, whereas other optical tubes or even better binoculars can create a much more engaging experience for other targets. And we're going to look at a few different targets tonight and think about how the optical instrument relates. But all of this is ultimately going to ask us to think about feelings. And I think, you know, at the end of this lecture, um, we're going to talk about how this could be helpful for you to plan your sessions. If you start getting a little bored with looking at the five brightest targets over and over again, the moon, Saturn's rings, Andromeda galaxy, what can you do to spice up your observing sessions, right? Secondly, we're going to talk about how you can use this to share with friends and family and try to get them hooked or at least broaden their perspectives on what's going on up there. And then thirdly, and I think super relevant for our organization and for JGAP, is how, do, how could we think about using this for public engagement and outreach? And I think feelings are super important. We want to create an emotional experience at that eyepiece. So this is really just me sort of playing with this a little bit. And again, I hope at any point here at the end, we can have a fun conversation about it. Um, maybe I need to go here. Okay, we'll do it that way. How could we feel the cosmos, like literally, like through our nerve endings? The only thing I could come up with is walking around on this beautiful ball of dirt, right? We are, in fact, traveling through space Space spinning uh, around a, a star, right? So we are astronauts out in space and we are on this ball of dirt. Crunch your toes in the soil or in the sand or in the grass a little bit and enjoy that. Um, let's keep this interactive. That's how I like to teach. Is there any other way that we think? Yeah, Don? Handle a meteor. Do we have them here? Okay, that's amazing. I did not know that. I, and I should probably embarrass myself. I've never come for a Friday event, so um, shame on me. All right, so you can literally handle a meteorite. That's amazing. Uh, any other ideas for how we could engage the, uh, the feeling sense in this, uh, in this pursuit? Warmth of the sun. Yeah, see that radiation in action. Um, I like that. I'm going to come back to the sun a little bit later, but I think that's a really, I hadn't thought about that dimension of it. That's a good one. Well, just go out to a, a place that's really dark and, and a clear night and just take it in. Yep. I mean, you know, in Columbus, you know, you get right. a feeling, but right. have you ever been out someplace where it's really dark and just stand out and feel when there's no light? It's what? a whole different experience. What does that feel like? The feeling of uh, the dimensions of the cosmos, you know, just how you know, how vast things is. Small. Feeling the dimensions, like, feeling small, no doubt. I felt that. So, yeah, yeah I, um, during the total solar eclipse, you know, feeling the temperature drop and the wind pick up. Big time. You, you feel, you feel. Yeah. 
Um, this is that is you guys blew me away. I, I definitely lowballed it here. We can do a lot better than sticking our toes in the dirt, apparently. Um, but let's keep thinking about it. Let's think about specifically constructing a sensory experience for ourselves as beginning astronomers and speaking for myself and uh, for those who we might want to be introducing to the uh, to the hobby. Uh, hearing the cosmos, the best I could come up with with my amateur brain is radio astronomy featured prominently in the movie Contact. Yeah, um, probably hammed up a little bit. I don't know if you can be out there with your disc man listening to uh, the very large array, but presumably those computers can output sound output and, and they were listening for radio signals. Um, recently, uh, they developed some application of astronomical images that they'll post online, um, where they'll literally transfer, transform the data of an image into sound uh, for the cyclists. Are these like quasar kind of things? or? Yeah, so Like a soundscape kind of a, that's incredible. I mean, I could have all kinds of uh, accessibility uh, for those who may be visually impaired. That could be amazing, but sign me up as well. Uh, that sounds really cool. I mean, we could start, um, I'm gonna try to remember some of these and maybe we could even start making a list of, of ways in which we could sort of structure these experiences, make these resources available as the five senses. We witnessed the, <coughs> we witnessed a, a meteor some years ago where we actually heard a sonic boom. Wow. Yeah. That would be incredible. Was that just, was that during a, a scheduled meteor shower? Or was that just, uh, you got lucky? We were, we were down at the Hocking Hills Lodge and there were people uh, who saw it, you know, simultaneously at first, well, almost simultaneously at first. Um, this was, uh, I mean, Brad's been, you know, in the hobby for 30 some years, and I think he said it was an order of magnitude brighter than any that he had seen up to that point. And I was going to make an impact? Oh, he made it. Uh, we were with Carl Coker that night, a former member who's now uh, out in California doing astronomical work. Um, and he had the presence of mind to actually count how long it took before we heard the sound. Because he knew based on the brightness that it's possible, it's possible ahead of time. And he counted. It's 180 uh, seconds. Yes, yeah, that's exactly right. From where you saw it to where you heard the 180 movie. seconds. And he did a quick calculation because he's good at math. Yeah. And you know, it, it's basically you know, the, the, the speed of sound, five seconds um, per mile. And so he said, that, that's 36 miles away. Wow. So we were very, very close because a lot of these bright meteors you see, you know, they can be, um, you know, up to a couple hundred miles away. Uh, basically, the curvature of the Earth, you know, limits it. But um, but you can sometimes see these uh, across multiple states. And in fact, this one was observed in multiple states. That's incredible. incredible. Um, yeah, so some, some opportunities to hear the cosmos is coming, coming home. Uh, to the uh, to the planet here, uh, smelling the cosmos, um, sulfur dioxide and um, what is it? Hydrogen sulfate are two really prevalent and equally stinky uh, molecules that form up on um, Venus, Mars, Uranus, and parts of Jupiter. So if we were to be on another planet coin toss would be we'd probably smell uh, sulfur. Is there anything uh, we could come up with in terms of smelling? All right, Don. Is that right? Yeah, they said the astronauts said the moon smelled like gunpowder. We forget to air them out. The paper starts. Right, a little, little moldy, mildewy, yeah. Yeah, certainly some familiar smells of the uh, of the hobby, for sure. Um, all right, so, right, right. Staying a little too late, getting up a little too early. 
insect repellent for real yeah so that's a hard one um most foundationally we look through these little straws at the biggest thing that we could possibly imagine and some of our straws have a little bit wider diameter than others and that has trade-offs uh that we won't belabor today too much but uh one of the things i learned in preparing this is we actually have more vertical peripheral vision than we have horizontal. It's, we're about 135 degrees horizontal and 185 degrees uh, vertically. <laughs> Newton's running an experiment here just to test me. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I was, I was looking into hunting some wild turkey. Those suckers can see almost 360. They've got 180 on each eye almost, and their eyes are mounted perfectly to the side. So if they just slightly tilt left and right, they get a full 360, which is why turkey hunters actually have to wear camo. Uh, we're, we do a lot less uh, well than the turkey in the optics department, but we still do uh, pretty well. And I've had this experience. I don't know if any of you who haul your telescopes all over the place have ever brought a friend out and they're like, hey, that's great, Don. I really appreciate you showing me that. Can I just lay back and watch the stars now? You know, and that's them really wanting to widen out, feel that expansiveness, expansiveness, that immensity. And I was a little disappointed when my buddy said that. I was, I just, I wanted to show him Andromeda. I wanted him to show him Orion Nebula. But uh, fundamentally, I understood it. You know, uh, these are two of the best instruments we could ever hope for optically in order to regard the cosmos. Um, by comparison, for the first telescope I got, which caused me to fall into the trap of more magnification is better, I ended up with a situation where the widest angle eyepiece I had, 38 millimeters, 70 degrees, super wide angle, Agena, gave me a field of view of about 1.5 degrees, right? So we're going from like 180 by 130 to 1.5 degrees, right? Um, for comparison, that's not even enough to fit in all of the Andromeda galaxy, right? You're just getting a, a sliver of it with my original telescope there, uh, which I'll have some specs on in a little minute. Uh, it's not certainly not enough to see the North American Nebula, NGC 7000. Again, you're just getting a, um, a small sliver there. Uh, no surprise on Andromeda. I think this is, this is past the Google test, but I'll defer to the experts. They, I, what I was able to discover is the Andromeda, if it was as bright as the moon, would span about six moons in width, right? So some of our deep space objects however far off they are, are actually quite large, much larger than my little 1.5 degree uh, straw that I was looking through. And that largely characterizes, and this is particularly, I think, for the beginners um, who are starting out, maybe picking out their eyepieces and their equipment, don't be so quick to jump on the magnification train. Uh, it has its purposes. If you're trying to see Saturn's rings in more detail, magnification is awesome. If you're trying to zoom in on a, on a lunar crater, up into the limits of your optic, uh, more magnification can be really nice. But what I found myself doing after I sort of exhausted some of the usual targets of like the Andromeda galaxy or uh, the Orion Nebula, is I started to want, want to chase other larger nebula. I wanted to look at star fields. Um, the double cluster, which I'll talk about in a minute, is one of my favorites. Um, and so I actually pivoted to uh, what was at the time a fairly inexpensive refractor, 120 millimeter uh, acro refractor. So it doesn't correct light as perfectly as it might uh, for some more demanding targets, but for looking at star clusters and, and nebulae, it's, it's pretty neat. Um, and you can see I go from a lowest magnification, I can punch up to about 250, 300X on my uh, Mac CAS. On this one, I can go as low as 17X, 20X functionally. But this is my most exciting discovery and paradoxically also the cheapest one, which is a pair of binoculars and what they call a zero gravity chair where you can literally rotate to like 
maybe like 179 degrees back. Now, some people have rigged them up and we were talking about that where you can kind of swivel it even and then you really got yourself an observatory. You can get um, arms that articulate to mount your binoculars on. So the binoculars are just sort of, you can go as far into this as you want or you could find a dark sky location pointed at the strip of Milky Way going up in the sky and just get lost with a pair of binoculars. Um, something is, you could even go down to seven, six X magnification and still really enhance your experience of the night sky uh, beyond using your eyes. So I think all of this is important to think about the ways in which we try to make the straw a little bigger. But in the process of doing that, we encounter this, this fundamental paradox. Generally speaking, you can find expensive equipment that can break all these rules, but generally speaking, as the field of view increases, uh, magnification and image brightness are going to decrease, right? Uh, what does this mean in practice? Do we want to see it all, but it's really small and kind of dim because we've only got these small openings of, of a pair of binoculars? Or do we want to see one tiny slice, but as big as and bright as we can get the aperture of the, uh, the optic, right? Um, and this, I think this is a fundamental constraint for us and really we wanna see it all and we wanna see it up close and brightly and you have to choose one or two of those. You can't have all three most of the time unless you've got some pretty wild equipment there. Uh, so again, just sort of tying up our, our first section here, we can't feel it. You've convinced me I was wrong on that. We can't hear it. I've definitely been convinced that's not true. Um, maybe we still have a hard time smelling it. Um, and we only see a tiny sliver at a time, right? So if you're one of those people that likes to think spatially and find their place, how can we develop an intuitive sense of where we fall in this grand scheme when it's either sort of all or almost nothing at any given glance. Um, and it's even worse than that because everything that we're looking up in the night sky is trying to deceive us, right? There's a grand deception happening here and it's not news to anybody. Everything we see in the night sky is projected as if it was on a two-dimensional sphere, right? So everything looks flat. I'm gonna play with that here in a minute. Um, many of the objects appear to be circling around us. This would lead us to the conclusion that the universe revolves around us. And um, even more paradoxically, some of those stars appear to be moving around in erratic ways. And of course, I'm talking about the retrograde motion of the uh, planets there, um, just because I think it's wild to watch. Um, I have a little um, view of the elliptical here. Um, and we can see Mercury going into retrograde. That's bad luck, I guess. Uh, Saturn, is it happening right now? Okay. Saturn's kind of hanging around. not sure it wants to follow its friends up in the top right there, right? So this is wild. And, and as we'll talk about in a minute here, for early astronomers, of which goes back to probably the dawn of man, um, this was a real problem to be solved, right? Why this was happening. So again, everything we see is however dimensional we know that it is, and forget the fourth dimension of space-time, um, is collapsed onto a two-dimensional sphere. And so it looks flat to us. It's moving, uh, it, all, it all seems to be swirling around us, which could create some false impressions about how the, the nature of the universe is stacked up. And the ones that, and some of them bounce around in erratic ways. So how can we use study, mapping and observing to uh, sort of solve some of these challenges that our sort of astronomical sphere presents itself and begin building an accurate mental map? This is one that I used to play with ever since I started reading about early astronomers and how they constructed their maps. What if I had never been handed an astronomy book? What if I'd never had an encyclopedia? What if nobody had ever explained to me that this earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around? Could I have looked up in the night sky, observed the behavior of some of these objects, seeing how light moves across the moon, seeing how the planets move through the sky, 
could I have possibly deduced the true nature? Um, we now know that we figured out the earth is round way before Columbus sailed the seven seas. Just one more person testing the hypothesis. Uh, the Greeks had it down pretty well, but it was really uh, difficult for humanity to come to terms with the things that produce retrograde motion, which is the motion of the planets around the sun. How did we figure it out? I think this is one way to start building our mental map and start situating ourselves as astronomers. Now, this is a fairly old book. What I love about it is it really starts from the dawn of time. Um, what were some of the earliest prehistoric ideas about astronomy and the, the nature of the stars? And how over time did we gradually stand on the shoulders of one another and accumulate the body of astronomical knowledge that we had at least as of 1985? I'm pretty sure their theories of supernova and black holes are probably absolutely smoked by now. But uh, a lot of the history in this book is, I, I find really, it's beautifully written. The illustrations are gorgeous. Um, I think it's a really neat way to begin thinking about this puzzle of retrograde motion is just one example of the, the puzzles of the sky and then thinking, seeing how human beings thought through that puzzle. It reminds me of a time that I visited the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. Has anybody ever had a chance to be there? Yeah, it's just such a, a monument of, of public, uh, public goods. Um, they have a, um, a, whatchamacallit, sort of the IMAX theater, the um, Stellarium kind of thing. What do they call those? Planetarium, uh, where they do these shows, but it's not like somebody puts in the IMAX disc and presses play. There are trained voice actors and actresses who actually narrate these stunning visual ex explorations. And the one that I saw was titled The Stories We Tell. And it begins with some pretty archaic, you know, early agricultural revolution, human theories about how the cosmos worked, the ones we all laugh at today and think, oh, those people were so silly. And then it takes us straight through until today and to some fundamentally unanswered questions we have today for which we only have theories, hypotheses, or stories by which to make sense of them. And the cautionary tale there was to know that at every given point in human history, we've always relied on stories to do it, some of, to, to make sense of the cosmos. Some of these stories are based on more rigorous mathematical models, but some of them are as equally unproven as, as many of our early theories. One of the things that impressed me about it was the amount of power that you could derive as an individual if you could predict the retrograde motion of the planets, because of course that helps gives you, give you an astronomical calendar, which of course would be incredibly useful and powerful uh, if you're a uh, early farming civilization, right? Um, so many, maybe many of the people in this room would have been the high priests of, of uh, you know, prehistoric civilization if you could figure out the timing of the motion of the planets. Uh, the society would look up to you and confer a tremendous amount of power upon you. Um, these, uh, the stories that we relied upon uh, in this prehistoric time were largely supernatural. We ascribed godlike qualities to why some stars zigged around in that retrograde motion, whereas others seemed to follow a more predictable path. Eudoxia, Eudoxus of uh, Sinaitis was actually the, one of the first ones we have written record of to actually produce a mechanical model of the cosmos. Of course, he got it completely wrong. It was uh, geocentric. Everything was revolving around the earth, but it was at least an early approximation of the kind of mechanical models, the systematic ones that we've been trying to move towards ever since. And we know the story of moving from the Ptolemaic model to the Copernican model and Copernicus missed a few things. I think it's interesting to think about this as a way of building our mental map precisely for the reason that when we look up at the, at the, at the telescope, sometimes you can see, uh, if you ever look at like Saturn or Jupiter, you may actually see, particularly on Jupiter, the shadows of its moons being cast on the surface of that planet. Right in that, we start to get this story about there's a sun out here kicking out a bunch of light. There's these objects floating around in 3D, just like our moon is, and they're casting shadows on each other. Again, this is the spirit of what I mean of constructing a, a sort of a mental map of the cosmos. 
and giving ourselves and those we're trying to introduce into the hobby the opportunity to understand a little bit of how we sort of ratcheted our way up to the knowledge that we have today and emphasizing to them, as I constantly emphasize to my students in the social sciences, where I think we're still back in the alchemy period, uh, we have not figured it all out yet. Uh, now, call me, a, call me a liar on any of these, but uh, we have a series of robust findings that would suggest a pretty stable pattern of, I think, like 14 billion-ish years for the age of the universe. But there are dissenting opinions on that and some of them informed by evidence or uh, abstract models. How big, in fact, is this universe, right? Are we alone? Did galaxy stars or black holes come first? How did the Big Bang happen in the first place? What is dark energy? Uh, we're honing in on these, and a lot of times I think you could read the newspaper and mistake scientific articles for being authoritative, as though we have a definitive answer about any of these questions. But the truth of the matter is science is constantly in a process of checking and rechecking. And it's a, it's a science, it's a, it's the art of skepticism. It wasn't until pretty recently that the guy who invented the tectonic plates theory of earthquakes actually got validated as being uh, a proper scientific uh, explanation. So um, again, plenty of unsolved mysteries out there. So getting into the mapping, um, I'll be honest, I have no curiosity or memory for constellations. I sort of know the big ones that are nearby the astronomical targets that I like to observe with my telescope. But when it comes to uh, some of the more, more obscure ones, I just lack all imagination. Maybe that'll change over time. Um, we do have some other tools and these are the ones for the beginners that I've had recommended to me a lot. Uh, turn left at Orion is sort of one of these. Do you have a small telescope with low magnification? Here's what kind of objects might look great for you. And here's how you sort of go about finding them in the night sky. So it's a real sort of travel guidebook uh, that puts you out in the field looking up. Uh, this book, The Stars, I'll have a, a, a shot of the inside of this and a few slides. But this one is sort of a generic encyclopedia, you know, all the objects out there, and you can learn all the uh, technical details about them. What I love about this one is it actually has these diagrams that shows you the distance and the orientation of astronomical objects to one another. So for example, if you're looking at a constellation that may be not a cluster that actually lives locally in gravitational relationship with itself, but sprawled out over the cosmos, it has a diagram that sort of shows you what that actually looks like in 3D. Of course, we have our planosphere, which is what I started with when I was an 11 year old out in the uh, backyard. Um, and that can be very effective for finding your way around the night sky at different times of day and different days of the year. And then we have the electronic version of that Sky Safari, sky safari Pro is, be, is being one popular version. And uh, I'll play with that a little bit. Um, here's the problem I have with most of our maps. Take something like M42, the Orion Nebula, right? Big, beautiful, gaseous. Where the heck is it? Well, it's just up there, silly. Uh, a little below the elliptic, um, just hanging out. And, and that's fine. But where is that really? Here again, we're confronting this problem of our, our star maps are projected onto this two-dimensional plane. So I could be looking at the Andromeda galaxy and have, or sorry, I could be looking at the Orion Nebula and have absolutely no idea that it's inside our galaxy. In fact, it's almost our next door neighbor. You can't see this super well, but on the um, coming off of the Orion Spur is our sun and the Orion Nebula being pretty much in our galactic neighborhood here, right? So that star factory where gas collapses and forms nuclear explosions and that stabilize, um, that's almost our next door neighbor in our galactic context. So I'm pulling these shots from uh, this feature that's within Sky Safari called Galaxy View. And it gives you a top-down view of our spiral galaxy, as well as a cross-sectional view. So you can kind of make out the sun and, and M42 Orion and their location next to each other. It also gives you the big constellation uh, sort of uh, compass headings 
so that you can see, you know, heading out towards Sagittarius, Scorpius, um, Vela, right? You know what direction in the night sky you're looking, and that gives you an orientation towards how our galaxy in 3D is being mapped out under this 2D sphere of the night sky. And then I, I, I skip to uh, M31 Andromeda, which again, I pull it up on my star chart, you know, much like M42, it's a little bit off the, uh, off the galactic cloud. Um, it's hanging out off of a constellation there. Uh, how would I know that it wasn't also <coughs> located <coughs> in our galaxy? If I didn't have something like, you know, here's a scale version of there's the Milky Way galaxy and our sun located on the, uh, the Orion arm and there's Andromeda, right? Um, not an amazing <laughs> diagram by any stretch of the imagination, but it gives you a sense of scale, I think, um, of the relationship between these. Now let's have a little trivia question here. This is one of my absolute favorite. Whenever you get bored of, you know, Saturn's rings or Jupiter, the Orion Nebula, go look up the, uh, the double cluster there. Uh, it's NGC 869 is one of them and 884 is the other one. Is this inside or outside our galaxy? You have an idea? Inside, right? Um, there it is. It's the next arm over, the Perseus arm. So here we are on the Orion Spur. Um, there's the Perseus arm over here. Um, next town over, shall we say, right? M4, M54 is, I think, the only or one of the only, maybe the, at least the first discovered globular cluster that's actually located outside of our galaxy. Uh, it's part of the companion galaxy, the dwarf elliptical galaxy, Sagittarius, that's a companion to the Milky Way. I think it'll eventually crash into us. And here again, you can see it both in, in top down and cross-sectional view where it's located. You guys, hopefully you're starting to get a sense of what I mean when I talk about the desire to develop a, a mental map of the cosmos. I really wanna to try to understand spatially what I'm seeing when it's just smeared across that 2D sphere up in the night sky. Now, what about uh, the constellation Cassiopeia? Is it inside our galaxy or out? What? In? It is in, but it's sort of a trick question, right? This is a, the excerpt from that book I was telling you about. I don't know how, if I can like zoom in here. No, not really. Um, Cassiopeia is not in a gravitational relationship with itself. It's smeared out across dozens of light years, maybe hundreds. I can't, my eyesight isn't good enough to read my own uh, print there. But it's just to say, it looks like a 2D object when it's up in the night sky and a very recognizable one. This is the throne that the queen hangs from. But in fact, these things are not spatially connected to each other. And that's why I think this, uh, this book, The Stars, is so neat because it helps give you a visual sense of that in ways that even the uh, Sky Safari electronic uh, thing really can't do. But then we're all sort of, we're still kind of just fumbling around here trying to construct this visual map. Um, in the eternal war of Star Wars versus Star Trek, I'm a diehard Trekkie. And my ultimate, like, the first place I would go on the Enterprise if I were beamed up there, and I think about it every time I get on an elevator, is not the bridge. I would go to the Department of Stellar Cartography. Um, I have a little clip here uh, from an excerpt. Data's having a bad day, so if he's acting a little weird, don't be surprised, but um, um, check, this, check out. this out. And can, can we build, build this? this so the audio is kind of hokey, but it doesn't really matter. The viewer here is watching them try to understand how some Space time rupture is uh, blowing up the continuum. This is generations. Right. Your problem is just teasing us. We have to pay more to see the whole episode. That's right. Oh. That's right. <laughs>
Um, so yeah, I would love to put one of those in my basement. Um, and that's, that's really the sort of this, this childlike impulse I have to, to really imagine being able to travel through our galaxy and even beyond to the Virgo supercluster in which we find ourselves, uh, at least in my own head, sort of visualizing the relationship between all these different, um, Targets of ours. Oh my gosh, please. Do you know, do you remember the name of it by chance? Celestia. Celestia? Here is all my money. <laughs> Okay, okay. No kidding. Does it also support VR by chance? I don't know. Okay. Right on. In, in some happy post COVID world, I do have a pair of uh, Oculus Quest 2s. So if the club was ever doing outreach again when we weren't worried about gear and sweat or whatever. Um, we could totally imagine setting something like that up with the VR goggles, as long as I get to be first in line. Um, so a quick recap of where we've been, and then I'll wrap us up with uh, my last thoughts about finally getting to the eyepiece. Um, so again, amateur astronomers are largely limited to seeing uh, for their ability to sense the nature of the cosmos. Understanding how humans solve basic puzzles like why some stars appear to move differently across the night sky than others can help us understand how to imagine and visualize planetary motion. And then turning to deep sky objects, 3D stellar maps are beginning to allow us to explore the physical locations of different targets, right? Um, how can we translate this study and this sort of mapping exercise that maybe we do before we get out under the stars into an experience through the, tele, uh, through the eyepiece. And just one resource I want to uh, uh, share with you here is one that was put together with Neil deGrasse Tyson and a few other astronomers that, you know, the 3D themselves, it's not exactly stellar cartography. It's just the object printed in 3D and you got little glasses. We've all played with those before. But one of the things that it does really nicely is it literally walks you from the sun and moon out through the solar system, out into the local neighborhood of our galaxy, and then further out concentrically, sort of like that one scene in Contact, where it's sort of like, I can't remember if it zoomed into the earth or, and then zoomed out, but it was basically like getting us further. Eventually, it took us out and got us further and further away from the galaxy. Um, and out into where it starts getting into the cosmic web. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to show you a few of, of its sort of highlighted objects that we could think of as part of a star tour that obviously we might have to take the place in multiple days. It's not very good to look at deep sky objects when the moon's out. Um, I got in trouble with Jim by, for bragging about a, a bumper sticker that said astronomers do it at night. And not because he was offended by my crass humor. Uh, why were you offended, Jim? I forgot how. Well, because uh, you, you're interested in uh, getting a solar camera that would allow us to actually observe solar flares on the sun uh, during the daytime, presumably, right? And the technology is still 
definitely on the more expensive side, but it's getting cheaper and way better. And uh, a friend of mine on uh, Facebook uh, here in Columbus, he recently bought himself a, a solar optical tube and a camera to capture solar flares and other type of events. Um, the sun is so important. And I think there's lots of stories we can tell about the sun, the radiative effect of its heat. We can talk about the periodic table of elements and how every single building block of everything came from one of these things going kerplowy and then recombining itself into a different star, a younger star that makes denser metals and materials and goes kerplowy. And so the process goes on and on. Last month, we learned that oxygen comes only when large uh, stars go kerplowy and make supernovas. Gold comes in gaseous forms when a binary star system goes supernova and sends gaseous gold out into the cosmos to become a, a part of a planet someday. So I think there's lots of stories we can tell about the sun and some of them it seems like we can even do during the day before, maybe right at sunset if we're doing an evening program um i remember the day in astronomy 101 when the professor taught us how to visualize just looking up at the moon here's where the sun has to be here's where the earth has to be here's where the moon is and just and i've, I've lost that since then i need to beef up that muscle but this is, I think, another way to think uh, spatially about how light and, and, and space interact to create different patterns that we observe in the lunar cycle, right? And just even having that simple 3D model of these three objects, uh, even more fun when you're going into a lunar eclipse like the one we have coming up. So um, here again, I think this is a great place to start. The moon is so much fun to look at. Uh, for those of you who aren't experienced in looking at the moon, the full moon is actually the least fun time to look at it because when you can sort of see where light and shadow meet at different points along the lunar surface, uh, the shadows really accentuate that kind of a 3D vibe that can really reveal new features that you've never seen before on the moon. Uh, so while the moon may be bad for our deep sky observations, especially as it gets closer to full, there's lots of things we can do. And I think one of them is building this mental map in our heads of how the sun, the earth, and the moon relate to create these phases. And then uh, almost finally moving outwards, the moon's at 1.3 light seconds, the sun's at 8.3 light minutes from earth, the planets are all sort of scaled in light minutes uh, here in our solar system. Our solar neighborhood, uh, here's a couple of targets that we could point uh, observers at. Alpha Centauri is four light years away and Sirius is nine. Uh, the Orion Nebula, in astronomical terms, still relatively close by at 89 light years. Uh, the M13 cluster is 22,000 light years away. And then the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years away. Orion Nebula is 1200. Yeah. You'll have to take that up with Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> Either that or I was cross-eyed when I was copying the uh, figure down from his book. Yeah. Um, well, that's a bummer. I probably won't make that before retirement. <laughs> but um, at any rate, it's more than nine light years and less than 22,000. It sounds like. <laughs> um, so just some last slide, final thoughts, uh, some applications here. Again, how can we be more deliberate about planning our individual observation sessions in order to begin to think spatially about these objects rather than just saying, well, I'm in the Andromeda neighborhood. I'll just look at all the Andromeda targets. Um, introducing a friend or family member to astronomy. Is this a way to sort of tell stories? If, if none of you have been down at JGAP when Brad has usually a crowd around him, just really uh, dropping his knowledge, um, you know, this is sort of, if I can't always have Brad at me by the scope, this is, is this a way to sort of um, plan my own sessions and inform them and then share that uh, and pass that forward with, with friends and family? And then of course, can we think systematically about enhancing the sensory experience, the fundamentally the emotional experience of the public when they come to our telescopes and binoculars? Um, that's all I have for you. I really would welcome a conversation. Yeah, one of the things I like to do as well, particularly when I engage with the public, is put these distances, these objects, in some kind of context, like historical context, for example. Uh, you know, when I talk about the Orion Nebula, like I mentioned, you know, it's talking about the way, what does that really mean? What was going on in the world 200 years ago? Well, that was the middle, the middle, it was the Middle Ages here in Europe. Uh, at that time, it was uh, peak, I think, of uh, the uh, Ming Dynasty. China, uh, 
when that light left or that right. That light left that object. Yeah. And it's just now getting here. And in particular, you know, some of the Orion or uh, the Andromeda galaxy. You know, what was more like 2.5 million years ago? Well, our species didn't exist. You know, our ancestors, the Australopithecus, was walking the Earth's skin back there. So mm. in the 70s, they found a famous fossil of that species in Lucy. That's right. She dates around that time. Mm -hmm. So I thought he was like, she would walk in the Earth in the savannas of Africa, there in Ethiopia, southern Ethiopia. That light that we are just now seeing left that galaxy. Left Andromeda. Left Andromeda, and we're just now seeing it. I love that. And so, yeah, just putting it in that kind of context. So, you know, uh, M13 at 37,000 years ago, that was the beginnings of civilization, we're just learning to domesticate animals and agriculture, and starting to build communities and things like that, not long after the last ice age. And that's the fourth dimension. Right. You're giving us time. Mm -hmm. That's great, man. Thank you for that. Yeah, there's a similar thing. Uh, there's a there's a series of books by um, John uh, Burnham Jr., um, which goes constellation by constellation and um, and and tells you these wonderful things you. See, but the first, I think, uh, maybe 100 pages or so, um, you know, he's kind of orienting you to uh, the um, galaxy. And in one of the uh, uh, illustrations of the size of the Milky Way, um, he said, you know, if, if the Milky Way were sized down to fit in the continental United States, okay. then our entire solar system would be the size of a quarter, a U.S. quarter. And our sun would be a, you know, almost invisible dot on the quarter. And of course, you'd need like a microscope to see the Earth or anything on it. Uh, so, you know, these, these kind of uh, uh, representations of scale, I think, are one of the deep, they're intellectual exercises, but they do help us, to, I think, build that model. And that's what makes it, then you get this sense of awe, which is the feeling part of it. Well, I also here have several demos that I demonstrate programs. For example, we struck the Earth down to the size of an inch. How big and how far is the moon? The moon would be about a little bit smaller than a pea and about 30 inches away from the Earth. Okay. So about 30 Earth radii between. So, and if we shrunk the sun to the size of a volleyball, how big would the Earth be on that scale? The size of a head of a pen. You could put one million or yeah, one million three hundred thousand of these inside of the sun. Um, the closest star, Alpha Centauri, or Proxima Centauri, is a red dwarf star on this scale. This is how big that star is. Now, how far away do you think a four and a half light years from this ball would it be on the scale? Anyone guess? The moon. No. I guess. Nope. Uh, what you'd have to do is get your car, drive down to Port Columbus, buy a ticket to Honolulu. And then when you landed, get out and set it down. That'd be the distance. And what's between that? A lot of nothing. So just little visual aids like that are ways to teach kids. <laughs> Speaking of Kerplowy. Is there another hand? Somewhere? Now, going the other direction, we were all the size of a neutrino traveling through the earth. It's somewhat similar, but had a less traveled distance. That would travel right through yeah. my head. Right. Right. Right.
Well, thanks, guys. I hope to see you out under the stars.